Night Flight. Time to read, everybody. Time to read. Do, 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 do. For Vintage Original, November 2009. Copyright 2009 by the Harvard Lampoon. Good job, guys. Good job. Good job. Good job. Night Flight. Chapter 1. First look. The hot Phoenix sun glared down on the car windowsill where my bare, pallid arm dangled shamelessly. My mom and I were both going to the airport, but only I had a ticket waiting for me, and that ticket was one way. I had a dejected, brooding expression on my face, and I could tell from the reflection in the window that it was also an intriguing expression. It seemed out of place, coming from a girl in a sleeveless, lacy top and bell-bottom jeans. Stars on the back pockets. But I was that kind of girl, out of place, and I shifted from that place on the dashboard to a normal position on in the seat. Much better. I was exiling myself from my mom's home, it seemed, to my dad's home in Switzerland. As a self-exiled exile, I would know the pain of diaspora and the pleasure of imposing it, callously disregarding my own pleas to say one last goodbye to the ported fungus I was cultivating. I had, a, I had a course in my skin if I was going to be a refugee in Switchblade, in a town in Northwest Oregon that no one knows about. Don't try to look it up on a map. It's not important enough for map makers to care about. And don't even think about looking me up on that map. Apparently, I'm not important enough either. Hmm. Bell. My mom, my mom powdered in the terminal. I felt a pang of guilt leaving her to fend for herself in this huge, friendless airport. But as the pa pediatrician said, I couldn't let her separation anxiety prevent me from getting out of the house for eight or so years. I got down on my knees and held her hands. Bella's only going to be gone for the rest of high school, okay? You're going to have a lot of fun with Bill. Right, Bill? Bill nodded. He was my new stepdad and the only other person available to take care of her while I was gone. I can't say I trusted him, but he was cheaper than a sitter. I straightened up and crossed my arms. It was time to cut the crap. The emergency numbers are all are above the phone in the kitchen, I told him. If she gets hurt, skip the first two. They're your cell phone and Domino's. I've cooked enough meals to last you both the first month if you split one third of a Stouffer's lasagna a day. My mom smiled at the thought of lasagna. You don't have to go, Bill, said Bill. I'm sure my street hockey team is going on tour, but only around the neighborhood. There's plenty of space in the car for you, your mom and me to live. But it's no big deal. I want to go. I want to leave all my friends in the sunlight for a small rainy town. Making you happy makes me happy. Please stay. Who will pay the bills when you leave? I can hear my boarding number being called. I bet Bill can run faster than mom to the new Jamba Juice man. I am the fastest, my mom shouted. They ran off, Bill pulling her shirt to get ahead. I slowly backed away into the gate, through the jet bridge, and onto the plane. None of us were getting saying goodbye. For some reason, I always came out, goodbye. I was nervous about reuniting with my dad. He could be distant. Twenty-seven years of being the only window wiper in Switchblade had forced him to distance herself from others. By at least a window pane. I recall my mom breaking down and crying on the surf draft in one of the rows and just watching her stoically right outside the window wiping in powerful circular motion. When I saw him waiting for me outside the terminal, I walked towards him shyly, tripping over a toddler, and soaring into a keychain display. Embarrassed, I straightened up and fell down the escalator, somersaulting over the roller luggage and considerably placed on the left side. I get my lack of coordination from my dad, who always used to push me down while I was learning how to walk. Are you all right? My dad laughed, studying, studying me as I got off. That's my clumsy old bell, he had in pointing to another girl. It's me. I'm your bell, I cried, covering my face and my hair like I normally wear. Oh, hello, it's good to see you, Bell. Gave me a firm, gripping hug. Good to see you too, Dad. How strange to feel use their moniker. It's from in Phoenix, I called him Jim, and my mom called him Dad. I've grown so big, I didn't recognize you without the umbilical cord, <laughs> I suppose. I've only been that long. 
Had I really not seen my dad since I was 13 and going through my pet umbilical cord phase, I realized we had a lot of catching up to do. I hadn't brought all my clothes from Phoenix, so I only had 12 bags. My dad and I took them in shifts to his Viper. Before you start making chat about me being divorced, middle-aged, and going through a midlife crisis, he says, with hot our seatbelts, ankle straps, and helmets, allow me to explain that I need a very aerodynamic car, so a window wiper. My customers are any judgmental people. If I don't drag race to those windows, they're going to question whether I'm the right kind of, kind of guy to hang out the roofs. Push that button, honey. It raises a giant snake head. I hoped he wasn't thinking of driving me to school in this car. Every other kid probably rode a donkey. Ah, uh, I got you your own car, my dad said, after I counted down and said, blast off. The car looked, he started the car after turning the key in the ignition several times. What kind of car? My dad really loved me, so I was pretty sure it was an airplane car. A truck car. A U-Haul, to be exact. A U-Haul, to be exact. I got it pretty cheap. Free to be exact. Where did he get it from? I asked, hoping he wouldn't say the dump. The street. View. Who sold it to you? Don't worry about it. It's a gift. I couldn't believe it. A huge truck is store all of the bottle caps I've always wanted to start collecting. I turned my attention to the window, which was reflecting a flushed, pleased expression. Beyond that, the rain poured hard on the green town of Switchblade. The two green town in in Phoenix, the only green things are traffic lights and alien flesh. Here, nature was green. The house was a two-story Tudor cream of chocolate timbering, like a miniature eclair that makes you fat for days. It was almost completely blocked from view by my truck, which had a large graphic on the side of a lumber deck sawing a tree with U-Haul written above. The truck is beautiful, I breathed. I exhaled. Then I breathed again. Beautiful. I'm glad you like it, because it's all yours. I looked at my huge unwieldy truck and pictured it in the school parking lot surrounded by flashy sports cars. Then I pictured eating those other cars. I could not stop smiling. I knew my dad would insist on carrying my 12 bags into the, home, into the house all by himself. So I ran ahead to my room. It looked familiar. Four walls and a ceiling, just like my old room in Phoenix. I'll leave it to my dad to find little ways to make me feel at home. One nice thing about my dad is, as an old person, his hearing isn't too great. So when I closed the door to my room, unpacked, cried uncontrollably, slammed the door, and threw my clothes around the room in a fit of dejected, dejected rage, he didn't notice. He was relieved to let some of my steam out, but I wasn't ready to let it all out yet. That would come later when my dad was asleep and I was lying awake thinking about how ordinary kids my age are. If only one of them was extraordinary, then I'd be rid of this insomnia. Oh. I picked up my breakfast that next morning. The only cereal Dad had in his cupboard was the fish flakes. After getting dressed, I looked in the mirror. Staring black was a sallow cheek girl with long dark hair, pale skin, and dark eyes. Just kidding. That would be so scary. Staring back was me. I quickly combed my hair and picked up my backpack, sighing as I shimmied up the rope in my U-Haul. I hoped there wouldn't be any vampires in this school. In the school parking lot, I parked my truck in the only place it would fit, the principal's space, and the vice principal's space. Besides which was the only other car that stood out was race car with antennas stuck all over the top. What kind of a human would drive such a posh vehicle? I wondered as I walked through the heavy front doors. Not any kind of human I've ever met. A red-haired woman sat at the desk in the administration office. What can I do for you? She asked, eyeing me through her spectacles, trying to judge me by my looks. As a deeply mysterious person, however, I defy such judgment. She was pale, like me, a little large, obese one. You don't recognize me. I'm new here, I said strategically. The last thing the man needed right now was for the window wiper's daughter to be kidnapped. But sure enough, she kept looking at me. My fame had preceded me. And what can I do for you, she repeated. I know she probably only wanted to help me because I was the window wiper's daughter, the girl everyone had been talking about since my plan got in yesterday. I knew... They must say, what they must say about me. Bell Goose. <laughs> Queen, warrior, chapter book reader. I cleverly decided to play into their preconceptions. Salute. Comment allez-vous, s'il vous plaît. Oh, I'm sorry. How embarrassing. I took French in my old high school in Phoenix. Sometimes I just slip into it. Anyway, to put it in English, can you direct me to my next class? Sure, let's take a look at your schedule. 
I pulled her from a bag and replaced it into her pallid, chubby fingers, one of which was squeezed through a diamond ring like a sausage move slipknot. I smiled at her. She looked like she would make a grateful wife. It looks like your first class is English. But I've already taken English. A few semesters of it, actually. Don't be smart with me, young lady. So she knew I was smart. Flattered, I conceded. You know what? I said, I'll go. What the heck, right? Down the hall to your right, she told me. Room 201. Thank you, I said. It wasn't even noon yet, and I'd already made a friend. Well, that's some kind of people magnet. Granted, she was a middle-aged woman, but that made sense. I always told you I was mature for my age, especially because I enjoy the taste of coffee with hot chocolate and sugar and milk. I sauntered maturely over to room 201, flung open the door, and peered at the students with my chin out. The whole class could tell I was friends with older people. <laughs> the teacher scanned his attendance list, and you must be Belle Goose. Just love that name. That name is great. All of us attention was getting a little embarrassing. Take a seat, he said. Unfortunately, the class was too busy to hold my interest. Ulysses, Gravity is Rainbow, Oblivion, and Atlas Shrugged. Supplemented with the various lenses of Derrida, Foucault, Freud, Dr. Phil, Dr. Dre, and Dr. Seuss. I groaned loudly as the teacher droned on, introducing everyone's name. I'd have to ask my mom to send me some interesting literature, like those essays I wrote last year. When the bell rang, the boy next to me predictably turned to me and started talking. Excuse me, he said, hoping I would fall in love with him or something. Your bag is in my way. I knew it. You have totally your bag is in my way type. My name is Bell, I said. I wondered what was the more surprising part about me. My elbows, which are naturally pointy. Or my demeanor, which is apathetic to popularity, even though I've read all the popularity handbooks, so I could be popular if I tried. You can walk me to my next class. Um, sure, he said, wanting me. He made small talk on the way about how he was abandoned as a child and will only rest easily once he is avenged. His name was Tom. I could tell people passing by were listening in, hoping that I would reveal the mystery of my past. So what's Phoenix like? He was sieged. It's hot there, and sunny all the time. Really? Wow. You sound surprised. You must be surprised by how fair-skinned I am, coming from such a hot climate. Hmm, I suppose you are pale. Yeah, I'm half dead. I joked very humorously. He didn't laugh. I should have known. No one would get my sense of humor in Switchblade. He was like no one here had ever told us sarcasm before. Here's your class, he said. Can we reach the trigonometry classroom? Good luck. Thanks. Maybe we'll have another class together, I said, giving him something to live for. Trigonometry was all blah blah formulas that we just saved in our calculators anyway, and government was all blah blah tomorrow we're crossing the border to attack Canada. Nothing I hadn't done in my old school. <coughs> One girl walked into the cafeteria for lunch. She had brown bushy hair and a ponytail that was more like a squirrel tail in the context of her beady squirrel eyes. I thought I recognized her from somewhere, but I couldn't place it. Hi, she said. I think I'm in all your classes. So that's why I recognized her. She reminded me of a squirrel I hung out with in Phoenix. I'm Belle. I know. We've introduced ourselves already, like four times. Oh, sorry. I have a hard time remembering things that won't be useful to me later. She told me her name again. <laughs> Lulalu? Ziggurazia? It was one of those forgettable names. She asked if I wanted to eat with her. I stopped in the hallway, opened up my day book, and looked at Monday, 12 o'clock. Blank, I exclaimed. I penciled in, one drift classmate, and then checked it off while we stood in line. This was the year I would become organized. Mm. Mm -hmm. We sat at a table with Tom and some others ordinary. They kept asking me probing questions about what my intended interests were. I gently explained that they were between me and my potential friend. It was then that I saw him. He was sitting at a table all by himself, not even eating. Not even eating. He had an entire tray of baked potatoes in front of him, and still he did not touch a single one. 
how could he not pick up baked potatoes and resist them all? Even harder, he hadn't noticed me. Bell Goose, future Academy Award winner. A pewter sat before him on the table. He stared intently on the screen, narrowing his eyes into slits. Concentrating on slits on the screen, the only thing that mattered to him was physically dominating that screen. He was muscular, like a man who could pin you up against the wall easily at post, yet lean like a man who would rather cradle you in his arms. He had reddish blonde brown hair that was groomed heterosexually. He looked older than the other boys in the room. Maybe not as old as God or my father, but certainly a viable replacement. Imagine if he took every woman's idea of hot guy and averaged it out into one man. This was that man. What is that? I asked, knowing that whatever it was, it was an avian. That's Edward Bullen. Lulu said, Edward. I had never met a boy named Edward before. Actually, I never met any human named Edward before. It's a funny sounding name. Much funnier than Edward. As we sat there, gazing at home, gazing at what seemed like hours, but couldn't have been more than the entire lunch period, his eyes suddenly flicked towards me, slivering over my face and boring into my heart like fangs. And in a flash, they went back to glowering at the screen. He moved here two years ago from Alaska, she said. So not only was he pale like me, but he was also an outsider from a state that begins with an A. I followed the search of empathy. I had never felt a connection like this before. That boy's not worth your time, she said. Wrongly, Edward doesn't date. I smirked inwardly and snorted outwardly, tucking the soda mucus of Fila out into my pocket. I would be his first girlfriend. She got up to leave. Coming to Bildell? Duh, Lulu, I said. Lucy. My name is Lucy. As in, I love Lucy. All right, Lucy, as in... I love Edward. Maybe I'm special, but I've always had a, not, a knack for remembering mnemonics. Trash to the left. I believe throwing out my leftovers. Happy you can't. Well, I looked back at Edward to see if he had noticed that I too am a disciplined eater. But strangely, he was gone. In the ten minutes since I last looked at him, he had vanished into thin air. Turn around just in time to see that I missed the trash can by a lot. And my happy eating cake was flying towards the back of the girl sitting at a nearby table. Hey, she says, and, made, and cake made impact. Who did that? Let's go, I said to Lucy, grabbing her arm and running out of the cafeteria as the food fight began. When Lucy and I got to class, she went to sit with her lab partner. I looked around for an empty seat. There were two left, one near the front of the room and one next to Edward. His front chair had a wobbly leg after I walked past and kicked it in. There was no choice. I had to sit next to the hottest boy in the room. I walked towards the seat, circling my hips and raising my eyebrows rhythmically like an attractive person. Suddenly, I was falling forwards, sliding down the aisle from the momentous force of my plunge. Luckily, a computer wire wrapped around my ankle and stopped me from slamming into Mr. Franklin's desk. I quickly pulled it from the wall to untangle myself, stood up, and looked around casually to see if anyone had seen. The whole class was looking at me but probably for a different reason. I had a hologram patch in my backpack. From one angle, it was an eggplant. From another, it was an aubergine. Edward was looking at me, too. Maybe it was the fluorescent lighting, but his eyes seemed darker, soulless. He was seething furiously. His computer was open in front of him, and the synthesized melody from before it ceased. He raised his fist at me in anger. I wiped the chronicle desk off my clothes and sat down. Without looking at Edward, I pulled out my textbook and notepad. Now, without looking at Edward, I looked at the horde and wrote down the terms that Mr. Franklin had written. I don't think other people in my situation could do quite as many things without looking at Edward. Facing straight ahead, I let my eyes sort of slide to the side and study him peripherally, which doesn't count as looking. He had moved his computer to his lap and resumed playing his game. We were sitting side by side on the lab counter, yet he had started a conversation with me. It was as though I hadn't applied deodorant or something, but in reality, I had applied deodorant, perfume, and Febreze. Was my lip gloss smudged or something? I took my compact mirror to check. Nope, but I did have a few developing pimples up by the hairline. I picked up a pencil on Edward's desk and pressed it against the soft, supple flesh of my face.
They were a projectile kind. Satisfaction and contained. I turned to thank him kindly for the use of his pencil. It was looking at me in horror. His mouth agape. He opened invitation to all sorts of airborne organisms like birds. He grabbed the pencil and started wiping his hands with baby wipes and rubbing the pencil with Purell. Then he drew a circle around himself in chalk and returned to copying notes from the board, singing with his finger amiably himself. The term's contagious. Contagion alert. But Edward and Purell are strong for the endurance. I reached out to borrow the pencil again from my notes, but the moment my hand breached the chalk line, he screamed. It was unnaturally high pitch for a boy. The right pitch for a superhero, though. Mr. Franklin was talking about flow cyt cytometry, immunoreciprotation, reciprotation, and DNA microarrays. But I already knew that stuff from the audio tape I listened to on my truck that morning on the way to school. I moved my eyes in circles like they were on a Ferris wheel. This is the best way I know to keep myself from falling asleep. Every time I moved, my eyes moved toward the right, though. They kind of hovered there for a little bit. I couldn't help it. They wanted to see Edward. Then my eyes would go to the top of the socket, towards the ceiling, and stop because, hey, nice view. Edward continued his, to jab at his computer. With each pounding finger, I could see the blood surging through the bulging veins on his forearms to his bicep, straight against the tight-fitted white Oxford shirt, pushed cavalierly to his elbows, though he had a lot of manual labor to do. Why is he typing so loudly? Was he trying to tell me something? Was he trying to prove how easy it would be for him to fling me up into the sky and then catch me tightly in his arms, whispering that he would never sh for me with anyone else in the entire world. I shuddered and smiled coyly, terrified. When the bell rang, I stole another glance at him and shrank into a deeper sense of worthlessness. He was now staring furiously up at the bell, shaking all the muscles in his fists at it, glowering into his dark, heated eyes and loathing lashes. He clenched his hair in his aspiration, clinging to the tussled tufts raised his head to the ceiling. Then he slowly turned to me, looking into his eyes. I felt waves of electricity, currents of electrons charging towards me. Was it how to be in love, I wondered, for robot? Time and ionized hypnosis, the old adage came to mind. Beautiful enough to kill, gut stuffed, and frame above your fireplace. Suddenly, he jerked out of his base and sprinted for the door. As he ran, I noticed how tall he was, his long legs leaping in stride the size of my entire body, his arms so firm, the impact didn't make a ripple. My eyes were I hadn't seen something this beautiful since I was a kid in the skill of them. My sweaty fist turned my hand to rainbow. His shoulder blades shut against the shirt as he ran. They looked like white wings beating majestically before takeoff. Demonic white wings. Wait, I called after him. He left his computer on it, had a seat. Game over, the screen read. Game over indeed, I thought, using a metaphor. Can I copy your notes? I asked a regular human man. I looked up and saw a boy of medium height, dark hair, and a lean but muscular frame. I felt drawn to him. He smiled at me. I lost interest. Sure. Whatever. I said, handing him my notepad and suddenly noticing that I had doodled a picture of Edward. In the drawing, he had fangs, dripping with the dark substance. Soy sauce. I'm going to need that back, I said. That drawing was going up on my wall. Thanks, Lindsay, he said, mistaking me for Lindsay Lohan. He smiled again. What a nice boy. He had nice neat hair and nice clear eyes. We were going to be great friends. Great. Just friends. Walk me to the administration office, I said. We don't have a gym next, but I need my wheelchair. I have a condition which makes my legs become paralyzed every time I think about gyms. Okay, he said, letting me put my weight on him. I'm Adam, by the way. I think I saw you in my English class. That'll be great. As long as one of us takes notes, the other one, me, doesn't have to go to class. He was kind of getting out of breath as he dragged me along. Being close to me makes some guys nervous. Did he notice anything funny about Edward in class? I think I loved him, I said nonchalantly. 
William looked kind of angry with you when he fell and disconnected his computer charger. So it wasn't all in my mind. Others had noticed. Edward's awareness of me. There was something about me that evoked very strong feelings. Very strong feelings in Edward. Hmm, I said scientifically. How interesting. Here we are. After propping me upright against the wall, Adam staggered backwards, huffing and puffing. I dismissed him and stepped inside the office. And paralyzed for the next hour, I announced to the secretary, Go sit on your car, dear, she said, looking up from her copy of Daylight. I skipped outside my car, trying to daydream about... I don't know. Daydream about his powers as king of the cars, but I was too disturbed. First of all, if I had got my car for free, that meant that everyone else had paid more money for tinier cars. Secondly, I was pretty sure that there was something supernatural about Edward's something beyond rational speculation. So I stopped speculating about him and watched a procession of ants go by. Life would be much easier if I could carry Fink twenty times my body weight. End chapter one. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good story. Edward with a T. Mullen. And Bell Goose. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Okay. Part two. Well, part two through. How many chapters is it in this book? Parts two through eleven will come later. But this is the end of part one. And this is me signing off saying, have a nice day.